and welcome to the Victory Garden. Today, Roger Swain unveils a new landscape that he's been working on all summer long. It's a brand new pond garden. It's quite an exciting project, as you'll soon see. Roger will also be checking progress in the vegetable garden. And I'll be harvesting eggplant for Marion's recipe of the day. All that is just ahead, so please, stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations, by the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide renting tools and equipment for home gardening and construction needs, by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's Professional Plant Food for all home gardening needs, indoors and out, and by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. On this beautiful September morning, Roger Swain tells me that he has a long list of things to get done over at the Suburban Garden. So let's have a look. Well, hello, welcome back to the Suburban Garden. You know there's a little touch of frost in the air in the mornings here, and the sun's setting a full hour earlier than it was in midsummer. But this second planting of cucumbers has really come on strong since I took that row cover off. In fact, if anything, it's coming on faster than I can keep up with it. Why, you get these, these monster cucumbers. Look at the size of those. Well, you know, I think those are really too big to eat. It's just a matter of tossing them out onto the compost heap. The cucumbers that I like for salads are, are really a whole lot smaller. They're, they're like that and, and like that. Now, that's the right size for a salad cube. And on the subject of salads, Got a real neat pepper trial here where I've got a couple dozen different peppers in a single bed. But you know the pepper that's better than all the others? All summer long it's been this one. La Paris. It's a it's an Italian sweet type. It looks like a, a fiery red chili pepper, but it isn't. It's mild, but not without flavor. In fact, now that it's ripened, it really has that special taste of a of a ripe pepper. Got other ripe peppers here. Look at look at that, look at that bright. Yellow one, isn't that handsome? And there's one over here that's a little bit on the orange side. But nothing can quite compete with this bright red La Paris. Well, as long as I've got cukes and fresh peppers for salads, well, I don't think much about carrots, but the carrots are looking great. Look down in here. These are handsomely spaced. I won't be digging these till, oh, probably the first or second week in October. Spacing like this, I expect them to be an inch and a half, two inches in diameter, and a foot or so long. A lot of carrots. Carrots we can put in storage, keep all winter long. Now, carrots get planted only once around here. But beans, well, they get planted repeatedly because unlike pole beans, bush beans stop bearing. They put out a flush of flowers and, and a flush of beans, and then they stop blooming. But it takes only, oh, 50 or 60 days to raise bush beans, and so you can plant as late as the middle of July. You can see here, these went in about mid-July, and there, you see that as a young, young beans just beginning to form? Oh, in a week or 10 days, these will be ready to pick. Got some beans. Well, before I get to all the beans, let me show you this. Second planting of lettuce, oak leaf lettuce. Isn't that a striking? Here's the green, here's the red. And oh, these Brussels sprouts, they're making good progress. Another cold season crop, nice young sprouts forming up there. But as I was saying about beans, if you let the beans stay on the vine, well, they'll dry out. Here's a patch of beans that I've let mature. These are dried beans now. The nice thing about beans, it's the ideal bean for the, for the home seed saver because beans don't cross-pollinate self-pollinate, so a small patch of beans will breed with itself and won't cross with beans next door. And the time to harvest your own dry beans is when the pods are drying out, and when you shell out the beans and bite into them, you don't leave a tooth mark in the bean. See, there's no mark there, even though I bite into it. That's the time to just pull up the whole bean plant, just like that, bundle them together, and then hang them up indoors, someplace where out of the rain, and let them dry thoroughly. Let them dry down till 
All the stems are dry, all the beans are dry and crisp. And then it's simply a matter of removing the beans from the pot. The easiest way I know to do that is to take one of these. It's just an old gunny sack. This is actually a bean bag, extra select mung beans it once held. You take the dried bean bushes, stick them down in the sack. I gather the neck together like that, and a good stout stick. And here's the fun part. You just wail away at the bag like this. Turn it over and beat it some more to get all your aggressions out. Just smash it good. You can't hardly overdo it. And after you've done it a good bit, just roll down the top of the sack, take out the trash, the coarse stuff. No beans there, that's just pure bean stock and empty pods. And then pour out what's left. Look at all those beans. Just shake that out. Now, if there was a good wind blowing, I just pour these down like that. See the way this is called winnowing. Now, without any wind, I'll set this up in front of a fan, and the fan would blow all the chaff sideways, and I'd wind up with just about pure, clean beans. Now, there's a chance that there's some weevils in these beans, and the way to deal with them Put the beans in the freezer for 36 hours. That'll kill off any insects inside them. Then I'm going to put them in a tight glass jar. I can use them for seed next spring, or I can use them for New England baked beans. Now here's another crop that's ready to harvest. It's our leeks. Some of these leeks we're going to leave all winter. They're, they're really winter keepers. But these King Richard leeks, are intended for late summer or fall harvest because they're, they're not good winter keepers. And just want to dig one of these up and show you what a really lavish size, well cared for, well fertilized leek can have. Oh, that goes down to China. Let me just see if I can root that up. I have to come around the other side. I've either got a bit of ledge or these leeks go down farther than I thought they did. There we are. How about that? That's a good size leak if I've ever seen one. Now, I find myself puffing. Nature abhors bare ground. And I don't like to leave any garden empty, not if I can possibly avoid it. Here's where we had cantaloupe. Cantaloupe are all picked, vines are all gone. It's too late to plant anything, even a fast maturing crop of snap beans. So I'm gonna sow a cover crop of winter rye. Winter rye is a grain they make rye bread out of. It has a great big seed. It's real easy to plant, it's sort of a grass seed for beginners. You simply scatter it fairly thickly on Freshly raked ground, no need to add any additional fertilizer. About two pounds per thousand square feet if you're planting a large area. If you're planting late in the year, well then I like to sow it a little more thickly because it doesn't have time to make much growth before spring. Then with a steel rake, I'm just gonna lightly scratch that into the surface. In a few days that'll be up and it'll provide a green cover crop for the whole winter that I can dig back into the soil next spring. With that drink of water, this rye will germinate in just a few days, and it's the easiest way I know to improve the quality of soil. I've got a treat over here, but I think it's a ripe watermelon. It's been a modest summer for watermelons here, a little too cool and too rainy, but this melon has got a nice, yellow bottom and the tendril where the stem joins the watermelon is dyed back and there's a nice sound sort of like the sound of my chest and let's just have a look 
This is a honey red seedless. It requires a, a seeded watermelon. This is the sugar baby as a pollinator. And I'll just take a good kitchen knife, slice a wedge out of here. I like the way that splits open there. Oh, doesn't that look nice? out of that and have a taste. Mm. It may be September, but it's definitely worth the wait. Now, while I'm enjoying this melon, I want to take you up and show you something special, something that I've been saving all summer long to show you. Very early this spring, we decided a dramatic expansion of this garden, pushing it all the way back to the rear border of the property. Now, this meant almost 25% increase in the area under cultivation. What was growing here was choke cherry and poison ivy and bittersweet. But rather than simply replacing it with vegetables and formal borders, we decided to put in two different kinds of gardens. One, a woodland garden where we could grow shade-loving plants and some of the native and exotic species, and the other, a wet garden. Now, fortunately, we had a low swale, a boggy area that trapped water seasonally but dried out in midsummer. We decided to emphasize that, create a pond, build a stream flowing into it. Now, as you can see, six months later, we're already well along toward that direction. But we couldn't have even gotten started without a good master plan, and that was provided by our very own Tom Worth. Well, Tom, all these machines and men, I mean, I'm impressed. Is it beginning to look like you well, envisaged? It is pretty impressive, isn't it? And, uh, and it's beginning to take shape, Roger, as a matter of fact. Come look at this little uh, sitting area that we've just kind of developed here. It's something we hadn't talked about before, but it just came to be. You know, we have to be flexible about these things. We've got a mythical bench here. <laughs> exactly. And you see, the, I think one of the, the best parts of this whole plan is that we have some real topography here where we can get a good vantage point of the whole site. Yeah, so is this nice. is a lovely little spot. So we've created this. Uh, right here, All right. in this place okay. over here, we've br actually brought this bed across and put the, the bench right here. Uh -huh, so now, the line's a little different. The other part, yes. Now, the other thing that we've done is developed a sitting area and a gazebo over here. Let's go take a look. Oh, nice. I like to see that. Now, even though this looks rather barren right now, this will be developed into a little wildflower sort of hillside. Well, I like this curved edge here. Uh, that's one thing that we always try to do is to have no straight lines, nice, soft, that's sinewy nice. curves. Yeah, that's nice. Now, uh, Okay, it certainly so we... makes sense to put the gazebo at the high point. Okay, so it's up here. Uh, right. All right. Here we and are. the wildflower right. trail will Inside come in the here gazebo. Now let's, let's look behind us. Let's see how it looks now. Okay, so you're looking right down, right down there. To the right down to the garden. garden. Yep, off yep, yep. in this direction off, to the house. Off to the house. Beautiful. And then off beautiful. in this direction beautiful. Beautiful. Down into to the, the, uh, to the palm. Real nice. Real so uh, I think we have a perfect spot for it. This is the wildflower garden going behind it. Now the other thing we've, we've done... We've these trees here, so we'll have a... High limb shade. Be very nice for wildflowers. Should be pleasant. Just that dappled uh, yeah. shade. Yeah. Now over here in the sunlight, uh, we've created a little nursery position for you. Well, that's good. That's what I wanted to put and, these uh, conifers in. Some of these. Some of these were going to move fairly soon, but we had yeah. no other place yeah. to hold them, yeah. so it's yeah. kind of a holding area. Yeah. And these young ones will come along. Before right. We you know can it. propagate your wildflowers and yeah. give them away to very friends. Nice. And, very nice. Uh, now we proceed down here. Hey, this a uh, little little big to move this baby. Yeah. Uh, we Something. decided. We decided to keep it. It's really quite a beaut. It really is. And we'll play this up to advantage. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, this is part of what I call the iricaceous border, uh -huh. which will be uh, azaleas and rhododendrons dendrons and laurels, and maybe some associated trees and mm -hmm. shrubs, mm -hmm. some shadblow, mm -hmm. maybe some dogwood. Very nice. And that'll lead down here to the uh, pond area, which I'm very excited well, about. Well, this has always been a, been a wet slough, Tom. It's a marshy, boggy spot. Well, you told me about it, and I, I didn't realize it was quite as wet as it really is. I'll well, take a look. But the nicest thing about it is that it also is a spot where it looks like a stream might flow right through. So what we've done is created this little uh, uh, stream, if you will, yeah. at the edge. Yeah. And we'll take these boulders and rearrange yeah. them and let the water kind of spill nice, out into nice, the pond area. Nice, nice. And then we'd like to do some planting behind and in front. Uh -huh. Let me show you that. Well, I need, I need a space for, you know, sort of a work area to put things that I want to keep just a little bit out of sight. Well, I think we have just a solution for that the, uh, because we have a lot of tailings and, and some extra soil left over. And what we'll do is to mound this up, maybe just, another just make a berm. two foot higher and then move some of those conifers down here, evergreens, well, to be uh, nice. screen it out. 
Well, the the winter, thing, in the uh, winter time, you know, it's you need a little color. Like. Well, it's a little barren out here. It's particularly with this uh, very uh, sparse, deciduous woods. Yeah. So some evergreens in yeah. here would be, would be very nice. nice as a background. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that we'd like to do is just inside of these conifers is to plant uh, some flowering shrubs and trees, uh -huh. things that uh, will be good for the birds and wildlife in the winter. And they're appropriate for the edge of a marshy area like this. Yes, yeah. and, and there'll be all sorts of things that will blossom, you know, seasonally. Uh -huh. But what I'm most excited about, and we had a terrific uh, success at the New England Flower Show this year with a pond uh, planting where we can take the, uh, the edge here and develop some uh, marshy type bog-like plants Flag, right here, like that, yeah. yeah, and uh, reeds and sedges, and uh, and then go down into the lower part with some other floating aquatics. Very nice. Well, now you, in in the summertime, this traditionally this pond looks good now, but in the summertime, just about goes dry. How are we going to hold the water in here? Well, the mechanics are really uh, a high art, and we have Roger Hopkins to help us with that. Well, Tom Worth says we've got the best man for the job in Roger Hopkins. Roger, can you really make this little puddle hold water? Holding water is not going to be the problem here. Yeah? Trying to make this thing look totally natural is going to be a real challenge. So many times when you see a pond or a pool in someone's yard, it looks like it came right off the shelf of some department It's like store. a bathtub buried right there in the middle of the lawn. That's right. So what are you going to do here? Well, we're going to use a combination of stone and some of the natural features of the lawn sweeping in here, trying to make this look like a, a pond that was always here. Well, how about hydraulics, though? I mean, every summer this goes dry. I don't think that's going to be a problem. We're going to line this with this fabric, which... Uh, well, that looks thick. What is that? It's 32 mils. Can I tear it? Try. Uh, pretty tough. <coughs> You're right. Which side are you going to use? You can actually use either side. Green but I think we'll use the black side here. Uh -huh. and how are you going to how are you going to hide the edges so we don't see the edges of the fabric? That'll be buried back into the soil and underneath the stone that we'll be placing in here. Right. Well, now come next spring when the water comes back into here, isn't it going to displace the groundwater going to displace the liner? No, actually the water doesn't really displace water. The weight of the water in the pool will solve that problem. Well, I'll take your word for it. It sounds like it's going to be great. But listen, I see Roger Cook's got off his machine. He's our lawn expert. I want to go talk to him. Very Catch good. you later. Yeah. Well, Roger, it seems like just a few days ago, this was nothing but poison ivy and bittersweet and trees and scrub. Well, we got rid of the nasty stuff, but we still got all the rock left behind. Well, that's standard New England soil. It'll take some work, but it'll make a fine seed bed. Well, tell me what you've been doing to get ready to plant. Well, we take and come through and scarified everything to rip up all those vines, the uh -huh. poison ivy and the sumac and those yep. sort of things. Yep. Once we get the soil loosened up, we come in with a rock machine that you yeah, saw, saw us using. Yeah, I saw it. That, this is, boy, this is the bee's knees. Well, this saves a lot of backs, I'll tell you. And it, uh, it leaves us with a fine seed bed. And then, and then you're going to sow seed direct? Yeah. Well, listen, now, there's a lot of lawn here, but on the other side, Although we're going to plant here eventually, we wanted to buy some time and, and not have this all go up to weeds immediately. Now, can you, can you tell me what you've done here to keep it from growing? We've, we're putting a barrier down to keep the weeds through. This, this spun-bound material right here. Landscape fabric? I yeah, weed called? barrier, landscape fabric. It, it does wonders for us. It allows us to keep the weeds down. But it's pretty ugly. Yeah, well, that's why we use four or five inches of mulch on top of it. <laughs> this is great. This eliminates the chemical. And with a garden so close in the way we're all aware of pesticides and herbicides, yeah. we're trying to stay away from yeah. chemicals yeah. as much as possible. So you can guarantee me we're going to have a nice lawn on this side, no weeds on this side? Oh, yeah. Sure. Hey, it's a deal. Oh, here you go. All right. Well, I've never, I've never spread quite this volume of seed before, Roger. Well, it's, it's very easy with this particular spreader. You just hit that handle, open it up. Parallel paths about six feet apart. And that'll give you just enough overlap that we won't miss any. All right, here goes. Oh, look at that. Isn't that even? Working good. Isn't that great? That's excellent. Yes, it is. All right, Roger. Now, you're raking that all in. Well, Roger, the important thing to remember is that any seed that's left on the surface will not germinate. It'll dry out. Like all bird food. All we're trying to do is put a light cover on it. And then what we do is come by with the old hand roller, 
light coating right over everything to get, firm get it. Get a good contact That's between it. the seed and the soil. That's it. And uh, that'll do it. A week to 10 days, it'll be green. Just a matter of keeping it watered. That's all. It's exactly two weeks ago today that we sowed grass of this lawn, and the result is a fine stand of young seedlings. Oh, there's an occasional perennial weed or two sticking its head through, like this dock. But if we keep the water going, the grass will come on strong. And when we mow the grass, we'll just decapitate these weeds. Before you know it, it'll be a perfectly satisfactory lawn. By then, of course, we should have gotten to work on this pond, putting in a liner so that it's watertight. It's really going to be quite a summer. Whenever you mow a lawn, you should try to never remove more than a third of the grass at one time. So that means on new grass, try to start cutting before it gets so tall that it falls over on its own. All right, well, the big day's finally here. We've got the heavy equipment. That's Herb Brockett on the big yellow tractor. Down in the pit, Roger Hopkins has finished spreading the sand. We've got a nice, smooth layer so we won't punch holes in the lining. That's important, because as tough as the lining is, we don't want to be putting holes from the underside. Well, Roger, this is a pretty good-looking sand trap you made, but too bad we're not putting in a golf course. Well, we uh, got about six inches of sand in here for the, uh, the liner to be yeah. cushioned good on. Good idea, yeah. Now, is this the final outline of the pond? Well, it's roughly final, but what we have to do is go through with the transit and make sure our water level is level Absolutely. all the way around. And then have at the far end down here uh, a place where it can overflow. It'll be the low point. We've got a lot of water coming down here, but most of the water is going to come down this stream bed. That's we'll right. right. Right through here, you can see like a uh, channel that has been... Is that the final grade you want? Is that about right? Well, we have to go through and clean out the sticks and debris anything sharp, and then we'll cover that with sand and then lay our liner out. Okay, give me a hand. Let's tip it upside down. It's pretty heavy, isn't it? Yeah. All right. All right, let me give you a hand. Oh, that is husky stuff, isn't it? Okay, carry it right on up there. Right on up here? All right. Uh, right. Um, lay it down in the middle. Yeah, towards me. Towards All right. me. This has got to overlap quite a bit. Then we'll run the other piece up under it. Right. Okay. Okay, Spike, that's good. That looks smooth, Roger. What's next? Next, we'll, uh, we'll get the boulders, and then we'll set those, and then cut the vinyl. After it's down. Uh -huh. strips up. Hey, this is great. We've already got 13 inches of water in here. Now, let me show you what we've done. This piece of plastic now runs over a much larger piece that lines the body of the pond. And we've got three hoses going at once, filling it, water coming out of our well. And when the water gets up to the edge of this rock, then we'll know the outline of the finished pond. We can come in here and cut back the liner, bury the edge, and bring in the plants and start landscaping. Well, Roger, you and Tom Worth and all those other guys named Roger have done one heck of a nice job and I'm anxious to see how it'll turn out over time. Well, Marion tells me that she needs eggplant for her recipe of the day. I think I've got just what she needs. Right there, that'll do it. I'm sure you've all had eggplant 
baked or stuffed or fried as a main course meat substitute. But here's a recipe that turns eggplant into a light appetizer. I have two eggplants. They're about a pound a piece, and I'm pricking them with a fork. And this is because I'm going to cook them under the broiler, and I don't want them to explode. And they go in, oh, I'd say about 10 inches below the broiler itself. And I'm going to turn them occasionally and cook them for about 30 minutes or until the flesh is just soft. Ah, look what's happened to our eggplant. But don't despair. That's just the way they're supposed to look. And now I need to cool them down. I'll let them sit over here on the side of the stove. Now the idea is to remove the skin and most of the seeds. This is not a pretty job, but somebody's got to do it. Now I'm going to scoop out with a spoon as much of the seeds as I can, and then just try to peel off the skin from the flesh. Okay, now here's the flesh, and I drained it a little bit. Look at all that liquid that came out of there. And this is going to go right into my food processor, along with the juice of one lemon, which is about a quarter of a cup. And I'm going to put a little bit of garlic that I've pureed with some salt. That's about a half a teaspoon. And then this gets all pureed together. Okay, let's see how that... Oh, that's good, because it's still a little bit coarse. And in goes a half a cup of chopped parsley and a little tiny bit of salt. And some grinds of black pepper. And then I'm just going to agitate this for a minute, and it'll be ready to serve. So, the next time you're searching for an unusual, light, and tangy appetizer, harvest some eggplant. Great job, Marion. And thanks to all of you for being part of today's show. And please come back next time to see how the new landscape turns out and for a visit to Pennsylvania to meet two exceptional backyard gardeners. Until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations, by the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide renting tools and equipment for home gardening and construction needs. By W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's Professional Plant Food for all home gardening needs, indoors and out. And by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants, supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. Now, home improvement is easy with helpful hints from Dean Johnson and Joanne Liebler. With useful decorating tips to advice for the dedicated do-it-yourselfers, Spend some time with the hosts of Home Time, next on KCET.